So what I want to do right now, guys, is lead off with a question. And normally I would have you write this down uh, on some scratch paper, but uh, I'm not going to have you do that right now. But in your mind, if you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't mind just kind of indulging me here, but I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you, what are the three most important things in your life? The three most important things in your life. So think about what, what it is you can't live without, what it is that maybe defines you, the top three things in your life, okay? And when you have that in your mind, maybe you even have them in order, I want you to take one of those things because of circumstances outside of your control, a fire, a car crash, the market crash, something. One of those three things I want you to cast away. If you had it in your hand, you'd crumple it up and you'd throw it away so that you're only left with two things. So now right at this moment, you only have two things in your mind. You're left with the two most important things in your life. And then it happens again. Completely out of your control. Circumstances that you had no control over. One of those things is gone again. So in your mind, you have to choose. You have to wrestle with, gosh, what is it that I could live? I don't want to. These are the three most important things in my life. But what is that one thing that I, I, it's gone? What is it that you have to get rid of? So right now, in your mind, you're left with one thing. If that one thing that's left in your life is not God, Jesus Christ, my faith, my worship of the Lord, Something to that nature. You still have something in your life that you can lose. I remember when I went through this exercise for the very first time. My three things on the list were my faith in Jesus Christ, my family, and my health. And then when I went through this exercise and I had to get rid of some things, and I contemplated what God was talking to me about after this, I realized when I cast away my health first, I would give up my health. I think we all would for our family, wouldn't we? I'd step in front of a truck to save my family. And then if my family had to go. God chose to take them home. My faith is what I would have left. Well, in my life, I realized that that's happened to me. I've lost my family and my faith at one moment. And I'll tell you what I mean. This is me when uh, I was a young man. That's my mom, Eleanor, my sister, Lorraine, and there's my dad when he was younger and a little scarier looking. I remember uh, thinking I had a pretty normal family. My parents loved me. We did have some good times. But what I didn't know because I was at such a young age was that my mom, even to this day, but my mom back then struggled very badly with drug and alcohol. And so there were fights at night. There were times I was left home alone. There were times that... I even played with the mirror and the white powder and the straws, and I made tracks for my matchbox cars. Now, I didn't know at the time what was going on. It didn't seem like anything to me. But then there was that one night. My dad always worked at the mill. He had swing shifts, so he was nights and days on rotation. And it was the middle of the night. I hear a knock at my window. I'm eight years old. And it's my dad, and he says, Joshua, go to the back room. And he says it pretty quietly. He says, go to the back room, open that back door. And so I thought, okay, it's my dad. He tells me what to do. I do it. And so I walk back there, and when I open the door, he puts a blanket around me, and he takes me away. And that was the last night I ever slept in the same house with my family. See, at that point, all of the issues that drug and alcohol addiction in my mom's life were causing, just destroyed the family. There was no chance for any reconciliation at this point. Things were spiraling out of the c- control so badly that I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes before that point and my grandmother would be picking me up because nobody would have been home. So my mom and her states would just leave. And so it's a bad situation to have, you know, a seven, eight-year-old boy laying around in a house by himself. So I didn't realize what was going on and then at that point, my family was gone. That's a sobering situation to, for me to think about. As I fast forward to where I was, my NFL career, we all see that there is a happy ending to what God was allowing to do in my life. But this is a picture of me right after I got drafted and I went out. This is the old stadium before the new lockers and everything was put in. But uh, I think you can see how excited I am. 
I had just gotten out there. We were about ready to start one of the first mini camp, mini camp practices there, probably in May. Little did I know that two and a half months after this picture would be taken, I would be trading that uniform, that helmet, that dream of mine, and my life would be changed forever as I was fighting for my life with advanced testicular cancer. All of a sudden, at the age of 23, the second most important thing in my life was taken from me. I remember what happened when I went in to tell the doctors, hey, I, I feel a lump, and I, I remember hearing something on TV that that might not be very uh, good case, and we had a game the next day. It was our final preseason game, and I remember telling my doctors, and I was a little bit embarrassed because it's in the area that you don't really want to have issues. And I remember the doctor giving me a self-examination at that point and looks at me with eyes I'll never forget, and he says, we need to get this looked at today. And so I went out to practice, and then they took me straight to the hospital. And on that September 1st, 1999, within the span of six hours, I was discovered, diagnosed, operated on, and released for testicular cancer. So at 23 years old, I had just reached the pinnacle of my career, the dream of all dreams. And all of a sudden, without any control of my own, it was taken away. And I lost the second most important thing that I'd ever had in my life, which was my health. Now the great thing is, at that very moment that I lost that, I knew exactly where I needed to go in my mind. I knew exactly where my heart needed to go. And it needed to go to God. It needed to go to my Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, a couple years prior, when I was in, a few years actually, when I was in high school, my sophomore year, God grabbed my heart. He'd been working on me for years. He had the right people in my life that had been giving me great examples. He had the right people in my life that had been answering a lot of questions and also proactively pursuing my uh, answers to questions. And so my sophomore year in high school, when I was presented with the gospel for the first time in the clearest form that I'd ever he heard before, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. The question that was posed to me at the beginning of that Bible study that I was randomly at was if you were to die today, how sure you'd go to heaven? That was something that I wrestled with for a very long time. I always knew that God existed, never a question. I always knew that heaven and hell existed, never a question. But I had no idea how to know for sure that I was gonna be going to heaven. And that scared me to death. So my sophomore year in high school, when I was presented with Jesus Christ in his true form, the man that lived on the earth, that died on the cross, and most importantly, that rose again three days later, defeating death on my behalf, defeating sin in my life, and all I had to do was just receive it and be covered in his righteousness. You can imagine at that point, I jumped up and said, I want that, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Fast forward several years to September 1st, 1999. I'm laying in an uh, outpatient uh, recovery room. They had just removed the tumor to send it off to have it uh, biopsied. At this point, the doctor said, you definitely have testicular cancer, but there's one good testicular cancer. There's one cell that if you have that, it's localized, you'll be fine. But there's three other very aggressive cells, and we're going to send it away. If it's that one cell, then you recover from the surgery and you can continue on. So my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, she was at um, L.A. training to go on a mission. Found out that I was diagnosed and had surgery, flew out immediately. So she and I waited that entire weekend, and I got a call from our team doctors that says, you need to come in. We need to sit down. We have the results. And so I came in, and I remember walking into the big room. Excuse me. I remember walking into this big uh, room, and there's a huge table, you know, a big G there. Everything's got the G on it, which is pretty cool. Big table. And all of the Packer brass and the urologist are on one side, and there's two chairs on the other. And that was an intimidating thing. And I remember sitting down, and the urologist looks me right in the eyes, and he says, Josh, you're done. I remember going... <laughs> done living, done playing, can we be a little bit more specific right now? He goes, you have all four cells, and the cancer is most likely spread. We need to get you more treatment, more surgeries. we got to get this thing figured out right away. And this is the thing that I did, and this is what I want to be honest with you guys about. I remember my initial reaction, my girlfriend, whom I'm trying to impress, is right here. Everybody on that side of the table who I've worked hard to show my Christ-like character and my separation from the world and my faith in Jesus is over there. And I remember going, hmm, well, I guess I have a battle on my hands. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. 
I tried to show them this amazing strength that I had, but inside, I didn't question God. And I don't say that demeaningly because some people do, and I think it's a good process for them to go through. I didn't question God, but I was terrified because the first time in my life, I was not in control of anything. My entire life has been, Josh, if you do these things, you're giving yourself an opportunity to achieve this. And that goal was football, of course, but I had a whole lot of other end goals that I wanted, which was to be a great person, somebody that's accountable for other people to rely on, a family man, all these other goals. But I always knew if I gave myself an opportunity, I could take one step closer to that. And then I wouldn't have any regrets if it didn't happen because I did everything I could to get there. Well, this is uh, what happened when I left that meeting. Everybody probably thought, we saw right through that. This guy's trying to pretend to be cool. When I was walking down this big, long hallway, I said goodbye to a couple of my teammates, and I was walking down the big, long hallway with my girlfriend, and we're walking hand in hand, not saying a word. I mean, I've just been hit with a club upside my head. You have cancer, and you're, you're dying, basically. And I'm walking down the hallway, and I, I'm trying to process because everything's over. I got to pack and I got to leave and find the best doctors in the world to go get treated. And I'm walking down the hallway and I remember I just collapsed. I've never collapsed before. I've never fainted. I've never been blacked out. I've never done any. I've never collapsed. And I'm walking down and my legs just went weak and I collapsed and I slammed up against the wall and I just started sobbing uncontrollably. And my girlfriend at the time just got down on her knees, put her arms around me, didn't say a word. And I remember I kind of went through that process a little bit, and then I stood up and wiped my eyes a little bit, and then we walked out. And she never asked me. She never talked about that because she wanted me to bring it up. So when we finally talked about that, she asked me, what, what was that moment like for you? And I said, that was the moment where I was the least control of my life. The doctor said, I might be okay. And now they're saying, we don't even know how bad it is, but it's worse than we thought. I would go home to Oregon, I would be up in OHSU, fantastic facility, amazing people, and I would receive the same uh, treatments that Lance Armstrong would, would receive, who had stage four. I mean, he had, he had brain tumors. He was way worse than I even was. So I got the state-of-the-art treatment. But I remember I had 45 lymph nodes taken from my midsection. So they have to have this invasive surgery. They pull all my guts out. My college roommate is a neurospine surgeon out of uh, Portland now, and so when he was doing his residency rotation up there, they let him come in and watch the surgery, and he goes, Josh, it was, it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's one thing to watch somebody that you don't know being worked on. It's another thing to see somebody you care about. And he told me the process. He says they have to remove everything, and then they take out all those cancerous lymph nodes. Well, when they take those out, they test them. So when I came to, I have an 18-inch incision right here that I'm recovering from. Everything's put back in, so it's not settled yet. So I can't move an inch right or left without throwing up. Brutal. And then they wake me up and they say, Josh, it's worse than we thought. All of the lymph nodes were infected. The tumors were starting and most likely it spread into your lungs and into your brain. You need to have chemotherapy. And so it's just getting worse. And then the worst, po worst part of this was it was a midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm actually laying in the hospital bed crying because the pain is so bad. My spirit's crushed. And at that moment, I'm not really again asking God why, but I'm just asking God, I don't know if I have enough to get through this. And that's where God wanted me to be. And at that moment, when I told God that I doubted I had what it took to get through this, he silenced me and he told me, you need to be quiet and think about what I've done in your life to this point. He said, I'm not surprised that you're where you are at this exact moment. I've been preparing you for 23 years to handle this moment. Not barely, but with flying colors. He said, why did you give your life to my son your sophomore year in high school? Because I wanted to know I was going to heaven when I die. I wanted to know that I would be in eternity with everybody that I care about that loves the Lord. He says, that's why you're more than prepared to handle this situation. Whether I bring you up out of this bed to walk this earth again, to serve me more, or I pull you all the way to heaven, a miracle has happened. You've given your life to my son, Jesus Christ, for a very specific purpose, and that is to be ready 
for these types of moments, not just the hard times in life that aren't life and death situations. That was the moment that God changed my mind and strengthened my life beyond anything I've ever had to that point. I thought I was a pretty strong guy. I thought I was a pretty mentally and physically strong person. But I realized that I had a little bit of a control problem in my own life, which many of us do as men, and God broke that from me to the point of a submission that when I was recovering from the surgery and not living in the hospital anymore, my girlfriend would actually sleep on the floor next to me. There were a few times where I had complications and had to be rushed to the hospital, or a few times where I had to go to the restroom in the night, I couldn't get up on my own. I was completely dependent on this frail, beautiful young gal to lift me out of bed, to take me where I needed to go, or to rush me to the hospital. I've never been so submitted to anything or anyone in my entire life. And God taught me that's the submission I want you to have with me. That changed me in a big way. I realized at that point the control that God wanted me to let go of in my life wasn't control that I was letting go of and my life was going to spiral out of control. It was control that he wanted to take over and make better in my life. The more I yield to God, the less stress I have in my life. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, I want you to try as hard as you can until you fail so that I can pick you up all the time. He wants us to actually rest in him. Quit swimming upstream. Quit trying to run into the wind. Quit trying to race away from God until you need him most. Walk with him. Rest in him. That's the most important aspect of what I learned through my process. Now, I want to take you guys through some scripture it's going to be quick, but this is a scripture that means a, a, an awful lot to me. And I'm going to, there we go, thank you. It's in uh, Mark, you can see it up there. If you don't have your Bibles uh, with you, you can read Mark uh, 435. And this is a, a scripture, and this is the thing that I want to, uh, to ask you guys to do. We all have probably studied this in depth. And what's going to happen sometimes, and it happens to me, is I'll see scripture, or I'll be sitting out there with you and, and listening to a talk and say, oh, I know this scripture, this is a good one. And I'll kind of zone out a little bit. This isn't rocket science. There's nothing in here that nobody's ever seen before in the history of the world. But I'm going to apply what I learned in this. And this is a scripture that sunk into my heart when I was laying on my back for an entire year fighting for my life. And it was a scripture that God kept reminding me of over and over and over again that gave me great encouragement. So let me read this. And I want to pull out three quick points and talk about what God was doing in my life through this time because of this scripture. Verse 35, Jesus actually is at the Sea of Galilee. He's been preaching to a multitude of people, and he's getting ready to uh, tell his guys, listen, it's getting late, let's head over to the other side. Verse 35, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. In a uh, furious squall came up, the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Verse 41, they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So there's three points here that I want to point out. The first one is, my relationship with God requires me to be completely in the boat with Jesus. It's a total commitment. This is where many of us will fail. This is where many people who really want to know God, but they're afraid to commit, will fail. I have so many people in my life, I have a lot of players on the Oregon Ducks football team that come to everything, but they're not quite ready to get in the boat. God requires all of us to get in the boat completely. See, what they did was they got in the boat and they went out to the Sea of Galilee. They got midway out. A furious squall came up. It's a great storm. What if one of the disciples didn't get all the way in the boat? I don't want to be completely with Jesus, so I'm going to hang on to the side. People are watching, they're seeing me get in this boat. I don't want to look like I'm 100% committed because I want them to think, hey, I'm ready to come over to you guys too anytime. 
What if one of the disciples did that and this storm came up? He would have had no chance. He would have been swept away to sea, swallowed up by the storm. But the disciples who were in the boat had a very serious issue, had a very big storm. Water was coming into their boat. But I thought it was interesting that Jesus is asleep in the back. It makes me wonder, what is going on with that? Has it ever felt like Jesus has been asleep in your storm? I mean, let's be honest. There's been times that I felt like, are you, are you here? Do you see what's going on? But God, remember what I told you when I was saying, I don't know if I have enough to get through this. The disciples say, Jesus, don't you care if we drown? I don't know if we have enough skill. We've been doing this our entire lives to get through this. Don't you care? Jesus wakes up at that point, just like he woke up for me. And he says, I'm not surprised. Actually, when I told you, hey, let's go to the other side, I knew this was going to happen. So it didn't stress me out. I'm not worried. We're going to get through it. It'll be fine. But I was waiting for you guys to come and talk to me about it. Because he wants their lessons to know, hey, where do you go when a storm comes? They tried on their own, didn't they, for a long time. Don't wake up Jesus. We can do this on our own. I like that. Second uh, point up here. Oh, i got to get my clicker. When the storms come up in my life and your life, he will always deliver on his promise. And so if you guys saw in there, did he say, hey, let's get in the boat and give it our best shot to get to the other side? No. He said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. So at some point during this squall, they decided, hey, maybe this isn't going to happen. Don't you care if we drown? I'm terrified. But Jesus promised them. He gave them a truth. He told them very directly, we are going to go over to the other side of the boat. Now, I like that because, or the other side of the lake, sorry. I like that because in my life, I'm still at a process. I'm still discovering, where are you taking me, God? What am I going to do? But I don't question now because he took me through some pretty serious stuff. I don't question that he's going to get me there. I might ask, how are we going to get there? Remember David, lo, I walked through the valley of death, but I will feel, fear no evil. Not around the valley of death, or I parasail over the valley of death. I walk through the valley of death, but I will fear no evil. Because God's promises tell me my end result is going to be exactly where he wants to be if I just seek him with all my heart. That's the type of person God wants in the boat with him. The third point, and this is the point that I love, and this means a lot to me, because I've been the beneficiary of what this third point will represent. When my faith in Jesus is shown to be real in my life or your life, it will directly affect and be seen by those around me. Verse 36, the second half of that verse says, and there were other boats with them. Now, Jesus didn't calm that storm just around his boat. And then say, look at those poor suckers out there suffering, right? The world was curious about Jesus. The world wanted to see and be around him and hear more. But they didn't want to get in the boat. But they wanted to see what was going on with this guy. He, there's just something different about him. But because of the blessing that he poured on his disciples who were 100% committed to him in the boat, that went to him when they needed him most, because of his blessing poured out on their lives, other boats benefited from that blessing and saw God's work. Remember the story of the man born blind? The disciples said, who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born this way? See, in the Old Testament days, they thought if you had any type of physical ailment, it must have been because of your sin or somebody else's sin in your family. Nobody thought, oh, this just happens because of sin in the world, because we're broken people, we're a broken society. And Jesus said these words, and I love this. He says, neither this man's parents nor he sinned that he is this way, but he's this way, he's blind, so that the work of God could be seen in his life. Gentlemen, the work of God to be seen in your life is as much for other people to see in your life as it is for you to grow in your faith in Christ. Other boats are watching. What I want to challenge you with, guys, get in the boat. A lot of times we're in an environment where it's a little bit difficult. We're challenged constantly. I had a gentleman last week that his work, where he works at a mill, everybody makes fun of him because he loves Christ. 
He's like, it's exhausting. I said, just stay in the boat. Don't compromise because that's what they want you to do to feel better about where they are. They're insecure because of your security. Stay in the boat. I guarantee you, as has happened in my life, other boats are going to start coming up closer and saying, hey, can I get in? What is it that you have that I don't that makes this whole thing worth it? One of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Not plans to give you all the money in the world and never have any health problems. That's not what it's saying. Plans to prosper you spiritually, emotionally, and not to harm you. Those are his plans for our life. He's speaking this to all of us. But here's the great part of this verse. My favorite word in the Bible, hope. Not to harm you, to plans to give you a hope and a future. Do you know that hope in the Bible is different from hope in the world? Right now, I greatly hope the Ducks beat Michigan State. <laughs> I know a lot of you greatly hope that I'm going to get done soon. I greatly hope that the pace of my hair falling out slows a bit. There is not a lot of certainty in worldly hope, is there? Biblical hope is this. If you get anything from what I say today, please write this down. I stole it from somebody because it meant so much to me and I'm going to pass it on to you. You can pawn it off as your own. Biblical hope is the absolute expectation of coming good. The absolute expectation of coming good. Paul in 1 Thessalonians says that the helmet of salvation is the hope of the coming Lord. The absolute expectation of Jesus Christ's return to this earth, whether I'm going to see the rapture beforehand or I'm in heaven and I'm coming back with him. The absolute expectation of coming good, the absolute expectation of salvation. Guys, if you rest on that, if you rest in his hope, you will have calm waters wherever you go, even when it's stormy. Amen? Amen? All right, let me close this out in prayer. Father God, I'm just privileged, Lord, that you beat me up so bad in this life. I don't regret a thing, Father. I don't regret anything that I've gone through because it was for your good purpose, Lord. If I have to suffer to magnify you greatly in the world's eyes, bring it on, Father. It stinks, it hurts, it's scary, it's troublesome, but I know that the ultimate glory is if one more soul, because of my faithfulness, comes into the kingdom, Father, what greater joy is that? Thank you for the men that are here that are carving out time on a Saturday when the ducks are going to win to come here and listen to your word and get encouraged by testimonies and draw closer to your son, the only thing that matters in our life. Father, I pray that the rest of this Roundup weekend would be impactful for me and for every one of these men in here, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for building us and designing us with a purpose because we know that you are in ultimate control of the greater destiny of all of our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. All right, God bless you guys.